JPN, a federal judicial television network. The strategy with the media uh, is interesting because we've never done it at that magnitude before. I set up a meeting with the media early on. Billy didn't have a warning that this media frenzy was going to develop. He knew there was an interest, but had no idea that we would get press from all over the world. By the time we got to trial, we had 48 uh, media organizations uh, that we gave seats to, and we'd draw six. 54 was about half of the people. If I could give someone some advice to prepare for a high-profile case, the Napster case, I would say prepare your team ahead of time so that you're ready when something like this happens. Oftentimes you don't have a lot of notice. Judicial Center, in cooperation with the Administrative Office of the United States Courts, presents Public Information and Outreach, the role of the District Clerk of Courts. And now your moderator for today's program, Bob Fagan. Clerks of Court are increasingly asked to play an important role in the Court's multifaceted relationship with the media, the bar, and the community. Hello, I'm Bob Fagan, a Senior Education Specialist at the Federal Judicial Center. Welcome to today's broadcast on public information and outreach. Today, in cooperation with the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, we're going to take a look at some of the key issues and challenges clerks face when asked to perform information and outreach activities. Through discussions with panelists both here in the studio and at our Push to Talk sites, we'll learn about effective practices that individual court units develop to meet those challenges. The court units participating will tell us what works for them. These same practices may or may not be effective for you. That's for your judges and your court to decide. As we saw in the open, the challenges are numerous. We have quite a bit to talk about in just two hours. Our hope is that by the end of it all, you'll have a working definition of public information and community outreach as it applies to the courts, Understand the role of the district court clerk in managing the multifaceted relationship with the media, the bar, and the community. Be able to identify successful techniques in working with the media in both high-profile cases and on a day-to-day -day basis. And finally, become familiar with effective programs and practices that help promote better understanding among the community, the bar, and the courts. We encourage you to participate ask questions, and share your thoughts with us. We've built time into our discussions for your comments. If you're not using Push to Talk today, send us a fax. Our fax number will appear on the screen throughout our discussions. You may send us a note at any time during the broadcast. A fax form was provided with the downloadable materials on our DCN site. The materials also include many references and websites plus a roster and program evaluation. Now, on to today's agenda. To help define public information and outreach, we're going to start with an interview of David Sellers, the Assistant Director of the Office of Public Affairs in the AO, conducted by my colleague, Judy Roberts. This will be followed by our media relations panel discussion. We'll cover not only high-profile cases, 
but also daily working relationships with the media. After that, we'll take a short break, and then our community outreach panel discussion will focus on both national initiatives and the efforts of individual court units in reaching out to members of the bar, schools, and the community. We'll then provide a short wrap-up at the end. And now to introduce us to the field of public affairs, as I mentioned before, my colleague Judy Roberts sat down with David Sellers, the Assistant Director of the AO's Office of Public Affairs, to discuss basic definitions and concepts regarding public information, community outreach, and the courts. Hello, I'm with David Sellers, the Assistant Director of the Office of Public Affairs at the Administrative Office. David, thank you for joining us today. You receive many phone calls for information and assistance in many areas, but your office is called Public Affairs. Could you give us a working definition of what public affairs means in relation to the judiciary? Sure. Public affairs is the, the umbrella. Uh, under that umbrella is media relations and community outreach, and, and part of it is also public information. But I think it's just as important to understand what it doesn't include, because public affairs in the judicial branch is really very different than our other two branches of government, as it should be. Uh, in the judicial branch, public affairs is, is dignified, it's conservative, it's educational, and very important, it's apolitical. In the other two branches, I wouldn't say it's the opposite, because I'm sure it's educational. I'm sure in most instances it's dignified, but it's very political. Uh, so you don't find judges, for instance, who are having press conferences on the courthouse steps, whereas you would find members of Congress and senior executive branch people who may have press conferences very frequently. Uh, so it's, it's a very different approach than the other branches, but I think it's just right for the judiciary. You've mentioned three specific areas there, and I'm wondering if we could get some more information on each of them. For example, public information, how would you define that? Uh, public information is probably the, the broadest concept, but there's a part of public information that, that flows into media relations, and there's a part of it that flows into community outreach. But I think the public information is how the public interacts with the courts, whether it be litigants or jurors or lawyers, the people who come into the courthouse. Uh, an example might be the, the growing number of courthouses that have kiosks in the lobby where the public can come and find where their, their, their cafeteria is mm -hmm. or where a courtroom is. Uh, that's an example of, of public uh, interaction with the courts. Now, media relations, I think we're all very um, familiar with many aspects of that. But could you tell us what the major areas that you work with are? Sure. You can really divide media relations into two areas. The first, of course, is reactive. And that means the phone rings, somebody has to pick up the phone and answer the questions from the media. The second is an area that the judiciary is probably a little less comfortable with, but nevertheless engages in from time to time. It's a proactive area. That is when we're trying to promote a particular uh, issue or event. Uh, for instance, uh, legislation that's important to the judiciary. We might take a proactive position with the media on that. Now, what's made this area of work a little more challenging is for years you just had to worry about the print media. Uh, nowadays we worry a little bit about the broadcast media, but not so much since cameras aren't allowed in federal courthouses. But the electronic media, the, the web-based media, has just had a huge growth. And uh, one of the challenges is figuring out how to, how to staff that need and interact with aspects of media relations also fall into community outreach and education. Um, could you tell us more about this area? Sure. Uh, ideally, there is a, a, a relationship between the two. Uh, community outreach and educational outreach is, uh, as it sounds, a way for the judiciary and judges to become a little closer with their community. Our community might be civic leaders or journalists or uh, other civic groups whereas education outreach is typically students and teachers. Now, the way we bring the media is, into this is when there might be an event in a courthouse that would involve uh, the educational community, mm -hmm. for instance, would be to try to interest reporters in covering this. We've had great success in that area. It sounds like the courts really need to be looking at these three areas specifically. Um, how important is it for them to be proactive in this situation? 
course, it's going to differ from court to court. Uh, I think just as many judges say, I never talk to a reporter or I never work with uh, educational groups as I've had judges say, boy, this is terrific. We ought to get involved. And I suspect we're not going to change a whole lot of minds real soon in either of those areas. My view is that it's important to get involved because the judiciary, as it's often said, is the least understood branch of government. And uh, trust and confidence is the backbone of the federal judicial system. And in order for people to have trust in the courts and have confidence in them, I think you need a first understanding. That's really what Leading the Nations and Outreach is all about, developing a better understanding of the federal courts. So by reaching out to the public and uh, educational groups and the bar ahead of time, then you have a friend when you're wishing to further and advance some judicial ideas and new legislation. Absolutely. Uh, it's true that the media and that the educational groups and the educational groups uh, Two years ago, we originally had a mock trial for law day, and the issue was judicial independence. But we allowed high school students, and there were some 34 courthouses that were involved in this, and brought in high school students to serve as jurors. And the idea being these were high school seniors. Very soon, they would be part of the jury mm -hmm. pool. So they had an experience with the courts early, and hopefully a favorable experience. So if they call me, they'll, they'll be willing to come. With the media, it really is a developing relationships, just like it is in any line of work. You want someone to some degree help you out, and you have to be uh, forthcoming mm -hmm. with them, and, and that's what we try to do with the newspaper. So it's continuous work, a continuous effort to communicate. Absolutely, and it's not always going to be positive, and that's, that's what we frankly have to understand, that media relations, ideally every judge, and, and certainly I would like that every story that's produced is positive, but that's not going to be the case. So when there are those negative stories, it's just as important not to shut down and say, I'm never going to do anything media again, although it may be our information. So are the negative stories uh, one of the greatest challenges that courts face when they're trying to implement programs? Uh, probably. It, it used to be probably as recently as 10 or 15 years ago that the media coverage of courts was almost exclusively related to cases. Probably 99% was a, a proceeding in a particular court. Well, it's probably still the case. It may be down to 97%. And unfortunately, the rest of that media coverage often is, is critical. And uh, so as a result, some courts are a little scared to get into the media area. My view is you've got to be there. You're going to make the phone calls. You're going to ask the questions. So the best approach is to be prepared and anticipate. David, it sounds like all these programs take a real investment of time and of personnel. Are there ways that court units can deal with this effectively so it won't be such a drain on their staffing or resources? Yes, I'm very fortunate in that I work in the Office of Public Affairs, and this is what we do 100% of our time. But I recognize of the 30,000 people who work in the courts, we're the only ones who are positioned like this, or there are an increasing number of professionals who handle public affairs work in the courts. But I think the most important thing that a chief judge and a clerk of court can do is to sit down and say, this is the era of public affairs. We need to recognize that it has to be a part of our life. But they have to limit what they're going to do. I recognize this is not their job. Some of them may not really want to engage in this area. So they have to focus. Maybe just pick the media relations or pick community outreach and start to invite some school groups to observe some trials and see how it goes and then periodically reevaluate. So as the clerk and the uh, chief judge and perhaps the management team are looking at their strategic plan for the coming year, focus on a small area. Don't try to do it all, is that's, what you're saying. Yeah, that's true. And it's because there's way too much to do in every one of those areas. And I, and I mentioned you might want to invite a school group in, but just the same, if you know there's a high-profile trial coming up in your court, I mean, usually you have some advance notice, even if it's a few months down the road, realize that's going to consume an awful lot of resources uh, with the news media and otherwise. So it may be that that year, that's what you should dedicate mm -hmm. to your public affairs efforts to. So if they're very selective about what will be in their goals for the year, they may meet more success and do it in an easier manner for their staff. And we find the same thing in my office when we have 10 people working in public affairs that I feel like we're just uh, biting off the top of uh, what we can deal with. And so we have to continue to focus and refocus and reprioritize now, the problem you have is that so much of public affairs, and primarily in the, primarily in the media area, is unpredictable. So you can be very engaged in a particular project, 
have someone can contact you about a hot heater issue which will take you off course for a day, a week, or a month. I mean, that's part of the fun of the job. It, are there any other specific ways that chief judges and clerks can work out a policy to enable them to work more easily together? I think an awful lot of what we're talking about here is, is good communications. And we have for a long time advocated that uh, each court have a press policy. And this may sound like a fairly basic thing, and I'm not suggesting there be any real control of the press. The press should have free access to the courts. But uh, reporters need to know, as well as judges and people who work in the court, what happens when a phone call comes from the press. Uh, several years ago, when the chief judges were meeting in Washington, the chief district court judges, I did an informal survey of about 20 clerks of court, district courts, and asked them how many had press policies. And most of them did not. And the, the common answer I heard was it's something that's informally worked out between the chief judge and the clerk of court, which sounds good, but as we all know, chief judges and clerks of court change, and sometimes those informal relationships don't go long. And other employees need to know what happens when the press is contacted. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I think is important is I know that judges meet periodically, or the entire courts meet periodically, and we've heard far too many horror stories about reporters who have contacted every judge on a court, asked them the same question, and then the judges don't communicate with each other. So it's helpful when judges periodically have their all judges meeting that they mention here are some leading questions that have come up, just for the simple ease of uh, coordination. Those are some good ideas, David, for, for all of us to follow. Yes, that's true. Absolutely. Um, I've had many people say to me, I wonder what David Sellers does when he finds himself in a difficult situation and doesn't have the answer at his fingertips. What do you do? Do you really want to know? I really want to know. Well, my first step is I go to the gym, I get on the <laughs> treadmill, I put on my Walkman, I pop in my Bruce Springsteen CD, and then sometimes the answer comes to me. When that doesn't happen, uh, I'm fortunate to have an extremely talented staff and a real veteran staff. Mm -hmm just some of the skills that are, that are in our office. And I can walk down the hallway and ask a, a reporter who had 31 years covering the courts and other things for the Associated Press. I can ask a state court public information officer who for 10 years developed a plan for the state courts. Uh, I can ask a lot of veteran people for their ideas, and that solves a lot of problems. Uh, but some other good resources are the state courts are ahead of us in many of these areas. That just about every state court the state Supreme Court or the state administrative office has its own public information officer. And they're a terrific resource to call and bounce ideas off of. And there's, there's actually a listserv of, of public information officers. And uh, so from time to time, I put questions up there. And within a few hours, I get a lot of responses. Are all these resources available for clerks of court if they are not able to reach you or they're trying to find out additional information? Certainly. I, I would advise clerks of court to feel free to to contact my office at any time, but certainly many of them may know their state court public information officers who are more than willing to help out. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't textbook kind of work, so you can't go to the library and open a book and say, okay, here's what I do. Now, there are some good resources on notorious trials and, and issues like that, but I've often said that, particularly in the media relations area, two plus two does not equal four, so you can't tell somebody do this, this is exactly what's going to happen. And I realize that's the frustration. Uh, another source that we tend to ignore probably is uh, our spouse, our neighbor, our mailman. I frequently find if you bounce ideas off these people who aren't close to what you do every day, uh, it's a good reality check. So it's like touching the public. We touch the public in everything we do anyway, and, and you, they're your reality check. And sometimes we're a little too insulated from the public, so this mm -hmm. is a way to, to, to get back involved. And it's been one of the real beauties of the, the community outreach work, which is relatively new for us, only about two and a half years old. It really has gotten us back in touch with the, with the public. It sounds as if when we're educating others, we educate ourselves. That's true. That's true. That's important because I think too often the image of the judiciary is that it's a somewhat closed uh, mm -hmm. atmosphere. And it's, uh, sometimes it needs to be but it is a public institution, and it's important that the public know that they have a vested interest in the federal courts. David, you're helping the courts now with the challenges they're facing today and in the next few years. What do you see as the next set of challenges that will be coming your way? Well, I think they're probably different if I can talk about media relations and outreach. In media relations, I, I mentioned uh, being 
increasing uh, inclination of the media to look beyond just cases, but to look at judges, who they are, their, their lifestyle, their travel, who pays for their training, uh, sensitive issues like that. So I hope we can do two things. One, we can sensitize judges and courts uh, to this is what the media is interested in, and hopefully do a better job explaining to the media why judges are different than the key players in the two branches of government. Because I think too often the media does not understand that judges can't talk about certain things that people in the other branches of government can. Uh, in the outreach area, we talked about the limited resources for the courts. Well, it's certainly the same here, and I think ideally education outreach would be getting into every school in America, public schools, private schools, home schools. Ideally, we'd like to be involved somehow with every one of those, and that's just not possible. Uh, so what we're trying to do is get, get the most bang for the end of the box mm -hmm. and uh, see what we can accomplish. You've given us some good ideas and food for thought. Um, what last piece of advice would you have for the clerks out there as they're looking towards the next several years? Well, the first thing I would say is to recognize that public affairs is not a dirty term, that some people still think it's uh, not appropriate for the judiciary, but I don't think you can feel that way anymore. As a matter of fact, the, the, the emerging democracies in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the court systems there are starting to train their judges on public affairs and community outreach. So I'd like to think that the federal court should, should be in the same position. The second is I don't think we can overemphasize the importance of the clerk of court and the chief judge sitting down focusing, prioritizing, and seeing where they can uh, get the most accomplished uh, here for the limited time that we have, we have won. We have found in quite a bit of our training and education programs that the team approach is very successful and time-saving, where when we try to do things by ourselves, it just takes too long and isn't efficient. And there's a terrific network out there. It goes way beyond the Office of Public Affairs at the administrative office. Of clerks of court who have great experience in this area and uh, they should turn to each other. There also was a judicial conference sponsored pilot program for public affairs professionals in the courts uh, that began in 1998. That has since gone beyond the pilot stage, and there are some courts who, are, who have and some more who will institutionalize that position. Uh, so there are people to turn to right now in the First Circuit, in the Ninth Circuit, and in the Northern District of Illinois at the district court level. Um, uh, what was the exact goal of that program? Uh, I think that the goal, in my view, was to show that public affairs cannot be accomplished just in Washington. Uh, I think it was Tip O'Neill who once said that all politics is local. I think you could easily say the same about public affairs, whether it's the media relations or the outreach area. We can do things at a macro level in Washington, but we can't get involved to the detail, nor frankly should we, that local courts can. It's nice to have someone on site who you can turn to uh, when you need them. And I know that they have made their services available to many other districts, even not within their own circuit. And we look forward to their continuing to do that. And the clerks, again, tapping into each other's knowledge. Great avenues for success. Absolutely. I agree. There's, as I said, there's a lot of talent out there. And every day we find out that there's a, a judge or a clerk of court involved in the area. And we learn just as much and more. That's excellent. Thank you so much, David, for joining us here today and talk, talking about how courts can be more active in the area of public affairs. Thank you. Thank you. Now, armed with that background in public affairs, we'll head into our first panel discussion, media relations and high-profile cases. Joining me in the studio is Cameron Burke, Clerk of Court for the District of Idaho, Daniel Lehman, Public Information Officer for the Northern District of Illinois, who in another life was a member of the press and can provide a reporter's perspective, and Richard Weir, the Clerk of Court for the District of Arizona. And joining us by phone is Jim Manspeaker, the Clerk of Court for the District of Colorado. Welcome, everybody. We're going to kick off our discussion today with a short video. So let's now take a look at some of the challenges court staff face when dealing with the media. We tend to think of high profile cases. When we were dealing with the media frenzy surrounding the Napster case, 
probably the most uh, important thing that uh, we decided was to be proactive toward the press. Rather than treat the press as a hindrance or a problem, we decided we try to make it as comfortable as possible for the press and to anticipate their needs. Proactive was a watchword in the 11th Circuit as well when Clerk Tom Kahn dealt with the media surrounding the recent Julian Gonzalez and presidential election cases. Not surprisingly, about every afternoon at 4.30, their interest went way up for the evening news feeds, both local and national. So we tried to tell them where we were and what, would, what we expected would happen or not happen. We put together a, a small management team in order to really analyze what the problems were, try to strategize as to all the things that we might face and come up with solutions for them. Like many courts, the Ninth Circuit learned that early planning is the key. We found that by registering the media early and posting the rules on the website, there was a lot more order in the courthouse. We also limited all our media inquiries to just myself, the chief deputy, or a senior manager. Our experience was they're looking for news anywhere they could find it. You had to be very careful what you would say. There were times when we just had to say, I'm sorry, you have to wait. We don't, we don't know anything more than you do, and quite candidly, we didn't know anything. As Northern District of Illinois Chief Judge Marvin Aspen sees it, media relations also includes building relationships. We know we're going to get criticized, and that comes with the territory. We expect that. We're not going to react every time somebody says negative, something negative about an opinion of the courts. But if there's an opinion, uh, or if there's a story, rather, uh, that misstates the facts of the case, or misstates an opinion, we're going to be prepared to be able to have a relationship with that media outlet so that we can say, hey, we're not telling you not to criticize us. We're telling you how to do your job. But look, you're wrong about this. In Judge Aspen's district, the proactive approach to the press also includes education. We're going to bring journalists into the building and uh, give them the opportunity to learn how the federal court system works. We're going to learn a little bit about their role, uh, show them what the uh, court system is all about. Not necessarily for them to write a, a story that day, but so that they will, uh, when they do write stories, it'll be uh, out of an educated base as to what the courts are about. Other districts find media visits an effective way to share the court's perspective. Have judges speak to the press as well about their accessibility um, and their inaccessibility in most instances. Why they were unable, from an ethical perspective, to talk about opinions they had rendered in cases when they might be uh, open to taking a phone call to talk about some uh, matter affecting the law and that sort of thing. We also use it as opportunity to find out from them how, how we can give them information, how better to uh, give them press releases, um, how to get better coverage. Uh, you know, we'll send press releases sometimes and they wouldn't come, but after we've had these media uh, briefings, we, we tend to get a lot more coverage from the media about the things that we think are important to the community. I'd recommend for other courts and also for us in the future when we deal with the press is to try to put yourself in their place. You know, if we're both, in essence, supplying a service to the public. Put yourself in their place. Sounds challenging in the context of a high-profile case. Uh, Rick, your court handled uh, a high-profile case involving the governor of Arizona. What did you find to be the most challenging aspect of what you had to do uh, in that case? I think the, how all-consuming these cases can be. They really do take the greater part of your day when they're going on, and they often go on for very lengthy periods of time. The other thing that was a challenge was determining who the stakeholders were in the whole process. It's not just the judge and the parties. It also includes the General Services Administration who runs the building, the Marshal Service who provides security for the building. It will include court staff who need to provide electronic access uh, to the media, as well as, if it's a jury trial, uh, the jury staff in your court. So uh, I think there are those things, credentials, seating, uh, the crowd control outside the building when you have one of these trials are all factors that you need to take into consideration. And let me ask you the same question in Idaho. We're in a rural district. You've got to be prepared for an enormous amount of attention paid to your small court. 
the crowds can triple or quadruple. There's more inquiries. In the Ruby Ridge case, uh, Judge Lodge did a, a great job in a procedural order. We had a challenge. All the media wanted access to the exhibits, the charts, the guns. And he arranged and, and required the media to just have a pool feed so that we just had one media outlet photographing all the evidence. And so that way it wasn't as uh, kind of much problem for our staff. Dan, as the public information officer in Chicago, what would you add? I would add that media likes to hear the word yes. And every once in a while you have to use the word no. And it can be the hardest word in the English language to tell someone. But it can also be a very disarming word. No, we can't do that. No, we can't do this. But if you tell them why, you add not just no, but say why you can or cannot do something. It helps start bonding the relationship between the court and the media so that they understand your role and, and the court's role and function in, in this story. Uh, now, we also have on the line Jim Manspeaker, the clerk of court for the District of Colorado, which handled the McVeigh case. Uh, Jim, uh, if you could choose one of the greatest challenges in your case, uh, what, would you, uh, what would you point to? Uh, it's very difficult, of course, to pick just one. There were so many. But I think, uh, as, as uh, has been discussed already, is educating the press uh, on how we do things or how we did things in Colorado. A lot of the uh, press that came to our trial and our proceedings had come from a very in, uh, famous case in California, and things were done just about 180 differently here. But getting the press early on to understand how we did things, setting the guidelines, working with them, communicating, uh, those were the, the biggest challenges early on. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we're going to be talking to a number of our Push to Talk sites. We have on the line the, from the Eastern District of Arkansas the Clerk of Court, Jim McCormick. Uh, Jim, your court, uh, court has had a few uh, high-profile cases in its time, most notably the recent Clinton cases. What was the greatest challenge you faced in terms of... Uh, of dealing with the media, and how did you meet that challenge? I think that probably the biggest challenge in managing a high-profile case is how to reasonably accommodate the needs of the media without disrupting the regular operations of the court. We found that one very effective method of addressing this challenge is to meet as early as possible with representatives of the print and electronic media and formally establish a media committee. Once the committee has been formed, the media needs to designate a coordinator who would be their primary point of contact. The coordinator would identify and consolidate all media issues and present them to the court, usually through the clerk of court, for consideration. However, it's also essential that the media knows that the court controls the trial and not the coordinator. Likewise, the court uses the media coordinator to distribute information. In order for this arrangement to be effective, all media-related issues and information must be referred to the coordinator for review and distribution. This process significantly reduced the frenzy in our courthouse, which was associated with the media's presence, because all information was shared in an equally equal and timely manner. Yeah, that's great. It's a great effective practice. Okay. Um, Returning to the panel here, let's say I'm the clerk and I find out that I'm going to have a high-profile case. Uh, what do you suggest I do first? Uh, how detailed a, a plan or a strategy should I have? And uh, how do you go about the process of setting up a media consortium? Uh, Rick? I think it, and it's been said before, but it's, it's true. You have to meet early and often, and you have to meet with those stakeholders that, that I mentioned earlier. This trial affects a lot of people and a lot of in, who are you know, carrying out a number of different roles. So it's important to get everyone together, to get them together early, and to cover every contingency that, that you can imagine. No one person can imagine, you know, the various uh, things that are going to happen. So the more uh, good minds you have working together, and communication, of course, being a, uh, a must throughout this entire process. But we used a media committee as well. It was particularly helpful, very beneficial. We had a representative from the print media, from the wire services, as well as one from the TV station. Uh, they served as a uh, kind of the self-enforcing body, if you will, for the remainder of the media that were, that were attending the trial, and it worked very effectively for us. That's great. Uh, I'd like to follow uh, this up with one, another of our push-to-talk sites. We, we have with us from the Ninth Circuit, Jim Hogstad. Uh, Jim, you were, you were in the clip we just saw talking about your experience with the Napster case. How did your court develop its strategy? When the Ninth Circuit had the Napster 
Master Appeal last October, uh, we decided we needed a plan to deal with the intense press interest. In order to do this, we established a small working group of just four people to develop our plan and our procedures. And our overriding principle guiding us was to be proactive towards the press. We even asked some reporters and uh, cameramen to tour our facilities and give us some advice for setting up our press room. And since the courtroom wasn't large enough to accommodate all the press, we even set up uh, closed circuit TVs of the oral argument in the press room and also in uh, overflow viewing rooms, as well as our little uh, courthouse cafe. And because of the planning, the event went uh, very smoothly, and we even received uh, many compliments from the press. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Dan, from the uh, reporter's perspective, um, uh, what can clerks of court do to, uh, to help reporters understand the court limits, if you will, and uh, understand what, uh, what reporters need? Certainly. The first thing everyone must, on the court side, remember is that the media is not the enemy. It needs to be recalled that the media is also mentioned in the Constitution. Their job is mentioned there as well. So once you can get past that stumbling block that, and recognize the fact that the media is going to be there whether you want them there or not, you can then start working through some type of a working relationship between the two. And that goes, uh, draws upon many of the things we've heard discussed here this afternoon. Planning in advance on the part of the district court, uh, or the court, rather, and then having, bringing in the media to listen to their concerns. And it would be best for the clerk of court and the staff to remember that the media is really another customer. It's another customer just like lawyers and litigants, bar groups. So if they're, if they're treated appropriately, they in turn will respond. And then finally, when you do come up with your plan and you've, you've, you've laid everything out, just because you've done certain things one way, or you've never done it that way before, doesn't mean that's the best way. Each situation is going to be different and unique. You're going to have to bend the way the situation is it unfolds before you. And in some cases, you might even have to amend some local rules in order to make things work for both sides. You're a clerk of court. Uh, you're asked a question. You respond to the media. But lo and behold, you've been misquoted. Now, how do you deal with that? Well, it wouldn't be the first time. Most misquotes in my in my experience, have been misunderstandings of misinterpretation of what was said, not outright misquotes. So, my by my uh, my experience tells me that most reporters are good, hardworking people. They want to get it right. Sure, there are some goofs here and there that don't belong in the business, but most are quasi professionals. Therefore, if you have a problem with a reporter, the first thing you need to do is go back to the reporter, him or herself, approach that person directly. Any reporter worth his salt, if it's an honest mistake, will correct it. If it's not an honest mistake, or if it's a disagreement in interpretation, then you have every right to approach that person as editor, and you should. But in that order, and a good, good helpful hint. Uh, Rick, let's get back to your case. Were there any surprises for you, uh, something that you didn't expect, uh, either pleasant or not so pleasant in, in dealing with the media in a high-profile case? I was surprised at how, how good the media were to work with. We really had a very positive experience. Uh, they were professional in all respects. They do need to know and understand what the ground rules are, what local rules are in effect that affect uh, that have an impact on the media. Uh, but they need to know when court opens, when it closes, uh, where they can go for information. You need to be accessible, and you need to convey that. But I found that they were uh, they were very good to deal with, and very professional throughout. And, and we had a very pleasant experience. Another question for Jim Manspeaker. In fact, two questions. I, the first part, I would, I would ask if, uh, if uh, there were any surprises that uh, you had to confront uh, in just in terms of, of dealing with the media, something that you didn't expect. And then a second part to that question, Jim. Um, you know, sometimes it's a public perception that once a verdict is in, the case is completed and the media just, just goes home. And uh, certainly that's, uh, that's not always the case. Talk to us a little bit, uh, if you can, about um, what you're confronting right now in terms of dealing, uh, dealing with the media. Okay. Uh, first of all, there are surprises daily. Uh, but you, you've got to be prepared. And right from the start, you expect the unexpected. If you planned well and you've kept your communications going, uh, that will definitely reduce any shock factor from the surprises. As for the public perception that once a verdict is in, uh, media thinks that it's over. That, that is not necessarily so true anymore because of what we call the talking heads. Uh, the, 
these attorneys that are uh, on all the TV stations now and doing a lot of the reporting of trials are well aware of the next step and will uh, call on follow-up and all that. In fact, our most recent, uh, quote, surprise with the uh, FBI finding all of the files, uh, a lot of these reporters uh, were actually <laughs> ahead of some of the lawyers because they had uh, done their homework, they had more contact with uh, the Attorney General, things like that, in learning what the uh, procedures were that the Department of Justice was going to follow. So uh, we have a much, much better educated uh, reporters now with these attorneys that doing all their uh, talking on the uh, talk shows and things like that. Uh, let me tell you, even after, in our case, after an execution, uh, it isn't over. That's why I'm not able to be with you all today. We're working on a lot of the follow-up, uh, getting the uh, expenses organized, getting the files organized, things like that for the archivists. There's still a lot of work to do. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Cam, what would you add to that? In terms of lessons learned, I would suggest not to get caught up in the spotlight of the national media. Remember to focus on your core mission. I would also say that uh, as part of your procedural or one of the experiences we've had in one of our cases was that you should direct where interviews can be conducted. As the trial went along, it seemed like the interviews got closer and closer and closer to the courthouse steps. And also remember uh, that whatever the media does, they do in 15 or 20 second sound bites. While I was involved in a, a case in Tucson doing uh, Rick's work, uh, on, the, on, the, on the Whoops case, um, they had a lot of questions about the technology, and those 15 or 20 second bites don't sound nearly as concise uh, as they should be. Uh, we've been talking about uh, uh, high profile cases at the, at the main office. Uh, we have Karen Mitchell, a clerk of the uh, Northern District of Texas, uh, with us on Push the Car. Uh, Karen, you had the Oprah Winfrey case in one of your divisional offices, Amarillo. How is that different than uh, if it uh, was in the main office? Uh, that's correct. Uh, the Oprah Winfrey trial was held in Amarillo. That's a five-person divisional office, and it's approximately 400 miles from our headquarters in Dallas. And, of course, that brought a lot of challenges because they don't have all the resources in Amarillo that we have in the Dallas office. I think two things were critical to the success of working with the media in the Oprah Winfrey trial. One uh, is we empowered the divisional manager to deal with the media. We didn't attempt to manage the media from Dallas, and I think that was very important. And secondly, we ensured that there was close communication with the presiding judge at all times so that we knew we were in tune with the judge's expectations. And those things, uh, I think, made, made that successful. Also, we've made use of our Internet website extensively, and I think that's been mentioned by several folks, but that is a wonderful resource. Thanks, Karen. Let's, let's follow up on that and talk about the web for just a minute. Huh? How has the, uh, the web, web helped uh, you, you uh, Kim, in terms of disseminating information? Oh, it is, is very helpful. You can issue uh, press releases. You can let them know about the pleadings. If you image your documents, you can have those, uh, those orders out immediately. Uh, and, and also, they can uh, get some background on the court if they're in interested in that. In one case, uh, we had 5,500 downloads in about a six-hour period. Imagine the impact on a small district like ours if we didn't have uh, internet. Hey Rick, did you use the web at all? And we did. We did in the Symington trial, and we made the, the daily transcript of the reporter available on the internet, and that was extremely valuable, uh, both to the parties and to the uh, and to the public, and, and as well to the media. Uh, they had it was a document case, so there were a lot of documents and, and a fairly tedious case, and so having the the ability to have that transcript and to have it at the end of the day was very valuable to the press. The internet gives reporters equal access, which is very, very fundamental to the coverage of a, any trial of any court. It, from, the, from the very beginning of highly complex cases, everybody has the same ability to see the same information at the same time, and that's, that's crucial. It also keeps all of those people out of the courthouse. Another example is, is posting opinion. Uh, in the Central District of Illinois, for example, uh, Jesse Jackson was involved in a very high-profile case involving some high schoolers and uh, came to the courthouse in Urbana. The judge there decided that he would issue his ruling in that case 
over the internet and said he would do it at a certain date and a certain time. And within the first hour of that ruling being posted on the district clerk's website, they had more than 6,000 hits on that site. So you can imagine that many people descending upon the small courthouse in Urbana. Jim Hofstadt, back to you in the Ninth Circuit. Your court also used the web of the Napster case. How did that go? Well, Bob, uh, it, it went very well. We uh, used the Internet site to post the instructions for the press and the public prior to the Napster case. Uh, we even had information on courtroom decorum uh, where the interested parties could go to watch the uh, oral argument since uh, C-SPAN and CNN was doing a live broadcast. So it was just great for us. We even put out, uh, you know, months later when the opinion came out, we uh, put out a 24-hour notice to let people know when it was going to be posted. So it was a great tool for us. Thanks, Jim. Ken, uh, in the situation in Idaho, you also had a kind of a web-sharing arrangement with another uh, district, correct? Yeah, actually it was with Jim McCormick's uh, uh, court in the Clinton case, their uh, web server uh, was so full that they pointed their router over to the District of Idaho, and we helped them uh, get out the word. That's uh, that's a great helpful, great helpful hint. So the web is indeed an important resource. Uh, before we continue, I just want to note that we're almost at our question and answer session for this segment. So if you have any questions, fax them in or, or get ready to use that push to talk uh, mic. Okay, this next question then is for uh, Jim Manspeaker. Many of our fellow clerks, when asked where they went to get information on dealing with the media in uh, high-profile cases, told us, well, they just called Jim Manspeaker. But my question is, where did you go, Jim Manspeaker, when it first became known that the McVeigh trial was coming to Denver? Well, actually, I couldn't go anywhere because there was so much press in the hall, I couldn't get through them. <laughs> uh, we didn't really reach out. We did uh, everything uh, kind of grassroots in-house. Uh, I, I would highly recommend, though, the uh, uh, managing the notorious trials put out by the state court group. It's an excellent book, and it, it recognizes, as I hope everyone recognizes, that not only is every court different and every case different, but even within courts, each judge handles things differently. So you've got to remember to be able to coordinate with your, your court the judge handling the trial and your staff and uh, managing notorious trials, the book is very helpful there. Yeah, in fact, we cite that book as one of the reference materials uh, that folks uh, can download from, uh, from the DCN. Good. Let's go once more around the table now. Just um, what do you think are the major lessons that you would want to tell uh, other, uh, other clerks? They've all been stated, but they're major themes we should revisit, and that's uh, uh, planning. Uh, meeting and communication, meeting early and often, uh, establishing a media committee and, and working through that media, uh, media committee, uh, being accessible, and by that I mean the clerk of the court has got to be accessible, return phone calls, be sensitive to the deadlines that the media have with respect to the information that they need, uh, provide a media sheet, uh, and be cooperative and reasonable. Ken? Uh, besides those, uh, the Use your resources. Uh, Jim mentioned one. There's another, the Media Guide. It's published by the National Association for Court Management. But use the experts in the field, uh, the elder statesmen like Rick and, uh, and Jim and, and others in the audience. We have a great resource out there. Start with communication with your bench. Get ready ahead of time. Plan. Get checklists and procedural orders from other courts so you're ready when one of these big cases hits. Dad, don't forget the public affairs office of the administrative office. There's also people like myself in the first, ninth circuits um, that are certainly more, more than willing and able to lend a hand. And, more, and as fundamentally as anything, grant equal access. Don't do anything to a one media outlet that you don't do to another. Jim Anspeaker, you have the final word. Okay, I totally agree with that. Uh, the fairness of the distribution of information. And basically, that's all we do is distribute information and uh, use your website. We were able to use our website on this last round, and I'm telling you, it really saves you. Okay, um, let's now open it up for uh, questions either via push to talk or through fax. Our fax number is below, so uh, send us a note, and, uh, and we welcome your comments. Let's open it up.
we did receive one fax, and um, and it relates to um, how do you prepare staff? And I'm going to throw this uh, open to all of the, the panel members. What did you do to prepare staff for uh, a high-profile case? We, uh, we sent out a memorandum uh, to all the staff that we're going to be interacting with the media during this period of time and, and to all, really all the staff because there were great crowds outside the building during the course of this trial. Uh, so we needed to ensure that staff knew what was going on, how to deal with the crowds that were out there. Uh, we also cautioned them to deal on a very professional basis with members of the media when they were asked questions. Uh, but you're right. I mean, a trial like this affects the whole court family, not just the individual judge and the parties involved. And, and all staff need, need to be made aware of the, uh, of the importance and sensitivity of this trial. Okay. Same kind of thing, an email to the staff, staff meetings, reviewing the local rules that really prohibit uh, court staff and attorneys, for that matter, for, from uh, talking about anything that's not part of the public record, and making sure that you have a plan in place where all media inquiries are, are uh, referenced to a certain person. It could be the chief judge, could be the clerk, or your media inquiry information officer. Okay. I, Dan, would, I, would, I would go back and reiterate that uh, media is indeed another customer. And again, you treat them no differently than any other customer. They don't turn tail and run. But if there are specific questions that you'd ask of the, of the staff of the court, that the staff has to know who they turn those questions to. So it's got to be very clear that either the questions go to the clerk of court, the chief judge, the public information officer, but they must know that from the beginning. Jim Mansbeck, you want to comment on that? Did you do anything to just alert staff of the possibility that they might be uh, approached by the media? I did indeed, and, and, and did it uh, orally because the, just a, a written memo, for instance, could become on the front page, so we did it all orally uh, when they're that hanging around so, so much. But we also isolated the case uh, out of the main clerk's office so that uh, the press and the public learned early on that the uh, deputy clerks in the main office had no idea what was going on with the case and such. We kept a public file uh, outside the main clerk's office for the uh, press and for the public but all of the, uh, everything, the docketing and everything was done in a separate office. So when pleadings came in, uh, we could handle them. If, if they had to be sealed, which about two-thirds of our case was, uh, we made sure the judge got documents ahead of the press so that he didn't hear about them on the way home, things like that. Uh, but we, we advised the staff that uh, they could be on television any given time walking to and from the building. So... Uh, did alert them and kept them somewhat apprised. Jim McCormick, what about in eastern Arkansas? Well, uh, I did it a little bit different. Uh, we put together the rules of the court uh, for the media, and I shared that with my office. The intake section here in Little Rock, I mean, they were awesome. Uh, they were uh, the first point of contact for some of the local press, so they were fully informed. And they, there was... They could share information uh, in, in an efficient manner with the local press. And, and that seemed to work in it and reduce some of the phone calls to my office. Um, a question that we got via fax, uh, logistics, relates to logistics. How do you know how much room in your courtroom to set aside for the media uh, in these high-profile cases? And is it always good to have kind of an overflow courtroom? Uh, one who uh, I, that's a very critical part of the planning process to, to determine how many seats you're going to set aside for the media and how many you're going to leave for the public that want to come in and see this trial. It is a public trial. And so that was one of the things that we discussed with the judge presiding over the case who has the final determination on that, as well as those involved. And then we had kind of a rotation or, or a lottery, if you will, for the media. Mm -hmm. We also, though, employed an overflow uh, courtroom uh, where the audio from the courtroom was, was uh, sent down to an overflow courtroom where the, where the working press could actually go in in a more informal setting and actually be working while they were listening to what was going on and, and beginning uh, to compose their story. So that was very effective, not only for the crowds, people who couldn't get into the original courtroom, but also for the press who were working in the other. And both were well attended. Kennedy? 
you want to work out those details with your media committee or your media representative as part of that committee and put that information in the procedural guide. Going back to Tucson with the whoops case, it, we had to put in so many tables in that courtroom. We put in, uh, we had to build 40 tables. There wasn't much room for the media. So there had to be a drawing of some kind to make sure that uh, that information was shared and they had to agree to a pooled feed on all media sources. Jim Mann, Speaker, I know that um, that you also have a separate media area, isn't that correct? Right. We Well, yes, we had actually a, uh, we had an overflow courtroom with audio and then we had a feed to the a room above the press room where, uh, as we say, the working press, those that wanted to go in and Bermuda shorts and take their laptops could do it. We wouldn't let them use cell phones because they would hold them up to the microphone and try to broadcast. But uh, we made that all available to the press. And then one of the big problems we had was that Oklahoma, of course, was an hour ahead of Denver. So that a we went till noon. It was 1 o'clock uh, in Oklahoma City, and they would have missed their, their noon news. The press was able to come and go from the uh, listening room and from the overflow courtroom, file their stories, and uh, make their deadline. So it worked out great. Uh, we obviously could talk a lot more about uh, about these high-profile cases. Um, we're now going to move on to the next segment, but before we move on, here are some points to remember when working on high-profile cases. Now that we've discussed high-profile cases, what happens when there's not a high-profile case? Uh, Dan, as a re uh, former reporter, we're going to ask you to put that uh, reporter's hat on again. Um, what is it that reporters really appreciate and would like the clerk to understand? Well, for starters, as we said earlier in this broadcast, they're going to be there one way or the other. It's their job. It's the, it's the function that they perform in our society of taking the information that comes out of the court and sharing it with a much larger audience than the court itself is capable of doing. So whether you like it or not, they're going to be there. So why not make that relationship as good and friendly uh, and as comfortable for both as, poss as it possibly can be? And you start that, as we said earlier, by laying out the ground rules. Here are the ground rules. This is what you can and cannot do in our court. Here are hours. Here are what you can not and can ask a judge, uh, a clerk, etc. Uh, and at the same time, uh, knowing that they're going to have different needs, that their hours of operation are not the hours of operation of the court. The court goes until 5, 4, 4.30, 5 o'clock and shuts its doors. Well, you still got 6 o'clock broadcasts, 10 o'clock broadcasts, and for newspapers, their first morning deadline isn't until, say, 8 o'clock in the evening. So find some way in which to accommodate their needs for news at the time they need it. That, that's important. And, uh, and and it's been mentioned before, two other things. Return their phone calls. Don't be shy. There's nothing worse than having that line appear in the paper. And the clerk of court did not return repeated phone calls. And finally, make an effort to get to know these people. They're human just like the rest of us. So go down and drop. If you have a press room, stop in every six months, every quarter, once a year. And, and just chat. Get to know them. Because they'll have the same concerns that you have. And it will go a long way to establishing a good working relationship for when you need the media for more than just a breaking story or an ongoing story. Right. Cam, what's worked best for your court in dealing with the press on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, I think building those communications is real important. 
we use media orientations in uh, the southern eastern division. Well, I think we have another one scheduled in August in the northern division. It's a great opportunity to talk about, to educate the media about the role of the courts, uh, myths, common myths. Uh, sometimes you see in the headlines, uh, defendants must prove their innocence. That, that kind of thing. You can go over what's secret, what's not, uh, where they can get information. There's a lot of real good uh, pointers that you can give them and establish those relationships. So these media days and these orientations are very valuable. What do they? What do you think the media feel is the most valuable aspect? They like talking to the judges. I mean, this is a rare opportunity for the judge to get out before the media and talk about anything about the courts, annual report, uh, case flow management, what's important to them. It's not related to the case. And they also like the fact that they can build communication. It goes two ways. Two ways. I, can, I have contacts, or the court has contacts, about who we can contact about press releases. But the media also knows who they can contact if they have questions. So it works well. Rick, what works uh, for the court in Arizona? You know, you have a lot of contact during these high-profile cases, but you also have pretty regular contact throughout the week on just the run-of-the-mill case that's filed in the court. So I think having a reliable point of contact for the media is all important. You have to be accessible, and you have to return phone calls, and you have to be cognizant of the deadlines that they have and what those deadlines are so that you can help accommodate them. Mm -hmm. In addition, we have press rooms in both of our courthouses in Arizona, and that's helpful as well so that the reporters who are on duty at the courthouse have a place to go, hang their hat, do work, and uh, have a place to call home. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about press rooms uh, uh, afterwards. Uh, Jim Mann, speaker, I'm going to throw this your way, too. What works for you in Denver? I understand that you conduct regularly scheduled press briefings. Isn't that correct? Well, we wouldn't go with press briefings. Uh, what I do every Friday, we publish our uh, court calendars for the following week on Thursday afternoon. So I take a look at those calendars, and I pull any, have a, any case that is set for trial. I have the file pulled. Any case where there's motions for filing.